times the day seems long, our trials are to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair, but Christ will soon appear to catch his
and preach a series of messages on prophecy and uh, some things about it. And I guess you could call this a smorgasbord this evening. I guess you'd call it a smorgasbord prophecy because uh, it's going to be uh, on the tribulation tonight. Now we've hit the uh, rapture, we've gone through the rapture and taught some things in prophecy of the rapture, the Christians going home to heaven and I've taught you the scriptures on, in the word of God on the judgment seat of Christ. Now the judgment seat of Christ is going on in heaven while on earth the great tribulation is going on. So those two events occur at the same time. One is up in heaven, one is down on earth. And down on earth is what I'm going to preach about this evening. Just some of the things. This will probably have to be several messages. It won't be, it can't possibly be just one or two messages. It will have to be at least three or four messages here on the Great Tribulation. Now if you have a piece of paper or, or uh, some paper or somewhere, you need to write some of these things down because these are some things that will be good for your knowledge and your understanding of God's Holy Word. Take your Bible this evening and let's turn to some passages on it. Turn, uh, turn to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, under the Pauline epistles. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, and let's start reading with verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Going to get a section of scriptures here for a minute on it. Uh, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that by our gathering together unto him, rapture, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is at hand. Now right there, somewhere in the notes of your Bible, you want to have a note that the day of Christ overlaps the day of the Lord. And that will give you an understanding of the day of the Lord and give you an understanding of the day of Christ. If you'll just put it this way, the day of Christ overlaps the day of the Lord. And you'll have no problem with the day of Christ being in the passage instead of the day of the Lord. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now here's something about the great tribulation that every Christian needs to know. And that is this. It's that a falling away first. Now you know what a lot of folks will come along and try to teach you. They'll try to teach you that the falling away is a falling up. Now that's really crazy and really weird because nowhere do you fall up. You always fall down. Now anybody with good common sense you knows you don't fall up. You know, brother, when you fall, you fall down, period. And this falling away is falling away from obeying the Bible, falling away from obeying the truth. This ain't falling away and going up to heaven. That's where folks get into trouble by not believing God's holy word and going to the Greek and going to the Hebrew to prove their point of the rapture here. And of course that's uh, nuts because that's just a perversion of God's word. Now notice here it says, The man of sin, the son of perdition. Then in the tribulation, the first thing you want to note is that the Antichrist has two basic names. Two basic names. Now he has other names besides that. The Antichrist is called the little horn of Daniel chapter 9. He's called the little horn of Daniel chapter 11. He's called the king in Daniel chapter 10. He's called the king of the north in Daniel chapter 10. He's called the prince. The Antichrist is called the prince in Daniel chapter 9. So the Antichrist has more than one name. He's called the idle shepherd in Ezekiel chapter 11. So the Antichrist has more than one name, many names, like Jesus Christ had many names. But his basic name 
is son of perdition. That's his two names right there. Son of perdition and man of sin. Now the reason why the Antichrist has two names is because the tribulation is split into three and a half years. It has three and a half years on one side of the tribulation and three and a half years on the other side of the tribulation. The first half of the tri tribulation, the Antichrist is known as the man of sin. And in the second half of the tribulation, he's known as the son of perdition. And the reason for that is because the first half of the tribulation, he's in Rome in the Vatican, sitting on the seat of Rome where the Pope sits, and that's where he will be. In the middle of the tribulation, he moves from that position and goes down to Jerusalem and goes into the temple and goes into the temple in Jerusalem and sits on the mercy seat and says, I am God. So therefore the Antichrist has two basic names. All right, again, so you want to know those. Now, take, now hold your Bible there because we're going to come back to 2 Thessalonians here. We're going to come back there in a minute. But I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 9, I want you to look at verse 11. Revelation 9, 11. All right, Revelation 9, 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abadion, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, Apollyon. Now notice it said, and in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. Now you know why the Lord said Greek there? You know why the Lord said that name was in the Greek tongue? Because he wants you to run to the Greek. When God wants you to run to the Greek, he tells you when to go there. Now you ought to write that down, brother. That's profound. <laughs> when God wants you to run to the Greek, He tells you to go there. He said, in the Greek tongue, it's Apollyon. Now, so in the Greek New Testament, the word Apollyon occurs one other place in the Bible. In the Greek New Testament. Because the New Testament is written in Greek, and the Hebrew is the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. You know where that word is found? It's found in John chapter 17 verse 12 now take your Bibles and turn there you need to write down you should have those passages you should have Revelation chapter 9 verse 11 and John chapter 17 verse 12 John 17 12 now let's turn to the passage I'll give you a minute to get there John chapter 17 and verse 12, and let's read the verse. John 17, 12 says, now here's the Greek word. Uh, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in the name. Those that thou hast given me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition. There's the Greek word, perdition. And that is the Greek word, in the Greek, they are the same Greek word. It said, the son of perdition. Now, where did you just read the son of perdition a minute ago? You read it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, our passage. So go back there. Who is he talking about here in John chapter 17, verse 11? He says, uh, verse 12, While I was yet with you in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that thou givest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. But, one is lost, but the son of perdition, that's the scripture might be fulfilled. Then who is he talking about in the verse? Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. <laughs> then without a shadow of a doubt, if those two words occur in the Bible, son of perdition, they only occur two times now, folks. They only occur twice. Son of perdition never occurs any other time. They only occur twice. What would that show you without a shadow of a doubt if the two only show twice? They are connected. They've got to be together. 
Now, if it was 10 or 20 or 30 times that you found the word in the Bible, then you could say, hey, it could have other meanings, or it could be applied different places, different ways. And you could say, well, how is it? How is it? What is it? What is it? But you only got two to deal with. Man, you can't apply it any other place than to realize that Judas Iscariot is directly connected with the Antichrist. No doubt about it in the passage. Now I'll show you another passage where he's directly connected with the Antichrist. All right, uh, let's take the other passage now. Take your Bibles and turn to the Old Testament. Turn to the Old Testament. And this time, get, uh, get uh, uh, Zechariah and get the book of Zechariah and pick up Zechariah chapter 11 and let's pick up another aspect of the Antichrist in, in Zechariah chapter 11 and let's look at verse 17 which is directly aimed at the Antichrist not indirectly but directly woe unto the idle shepherd underline it idle shepherd that idle shepherd there in the verse is the Antichrist none other that uh, li li liveth at a flock, leaveth the flock, the sword, there's a sword, shall be on his arm. He has something with his arm, something wrong with his arm. And upon his right eye, then there's something wrong with his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Then when the Antichrist shows up, he will have something wrong with his arm and he will have something wrong with his eye when he shows up on the scene, when he comes. And you look for a man down through history that's a type of the Antichrist and he will have something wrong with that arm. And they'll, they'll, those men that are a type of Christ will have something wrong with the arm and they'll have something wrong with the eye when the Antichrist is. Now notice again, back there in Zechariah chapter 11, that you find uh, the passages here talking about the Antichrist. Go back to verse 12 now and show you that in the context, not only is the Antichrist mentioned, but also is Judas Iscariot mentioned. All right, Zechariah chapter 11 verse 12 says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, Give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Write down Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 15. Verse 13 now. And the Lord said unto me, Cast into the potter a goodly price that I was, uh, was uh, perished out of them. And I, Judas Iscariot, and I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them into potters in the house of the Lord. Matthew chapter 27 verse 5. And then Judas Iscariot is connected with the context of the Antichrist in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 13. And the Antichrist is found in verse 17. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and the context is the Antichrist, and uh, I want you to read verse 9 this time. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs, the Antichrist will give signs, and lying wonders, and with all deceivability of unrighteousness, in them that perish. Now watch this. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Now the passage I just read you is aimed at somebody that came through the church age, rejected Jesus Christ, and went into the tribulation. Because that's the context of the passage. 
the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the Antichrist himself and the revealing of the Antichrist and then somebody going into the tribulation. You say, what are you trying to say, Brother Bemis? Number one, the tribulation is not a second chance for salvation. The tribulation is not a second chance for salvation. If you know somebody that turns down Jesus Christ right here and right now, you know what they'll do in the tribulation? They'll turn Jesus Christ down in the tribulation. They will not believe in the blood of Jesus Christ now. They will not believe in the blood of Jesus Christ in the great tribulation. They won't accept the blood there either, brother. They won't accept it now. They won't accept it then. So first of all, the tribulation is not a second chance for those that go through it. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. And I want you to read verse 4 this time. All right. Now pick up verse 3 again. Uh, following away first, that the man of sin be revealed. Underline that word revealed. Revealed. Then in plainer words, so the, the revealing of the Antichrist, the revealing of the man of sin and the son of perdition will occur at a particular time. It, it occurs and he will be revealed at a special time. All right, now let's go on. The passage is talking about the revealing of the Antichrist. Verse 4 now. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. He exalts himself above all that is called God. Or that is worshipped. So that he as God, underline it, sitting in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. Now notice it's sitting in the temple. Underline that. Sitting in the temple. Now take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. And turn to the book of Revelation. And turn to Revelation chapter 11. And Revelation chapter 11. And let's pick up the temple of God. That's the temple. Revelation chapter 11 verse 1. And I was given unto me a rod likened to a, a reed likened to a rod. And the angel stood saying, Arise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Now in the tribulation he's measuring the temple. Though this is not in heaven, this is on earth. And so the temple is on the earth in Jerusalem. The altar is in the temple and people are worshiping in that temple in the tribulation. So sometime between now and the middle of the tribulation there must be uh, something that occurs. The temple must be rebuilt. Whether that occurs now, or whether that occurs before the rapture, or whether that occurs after the rapture, I don't know. But I know it is there in the middle of the tribulation. The temple is there. All right. But the court, that, the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and a holy city shall he tread underfoot forty and two months. Three and a half years. All right, now again, back to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. Now notice it says, So that he which God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now where you're reading in 1 Thessalonians, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4, is the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation. That's the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation. Now let's pick up the Antichrist in the first half of the tribulation. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And here's the Antichrist in the first half of the tribulation. There's just some, some things about him. Matthew chapter 24. And let's pick up verse 13. It says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's talking about a tribulation man overcoming the mark of the beast and enduring that mark and not taking the mark of the beast. That's not talking about a Christian overcoming anything. It's talking about a tribulation man overcoming. Verse 14, And this gospel 
of the kingdom, that's what they're preaching in the tribulation, shall be preached unto all the world uh, for a witness unto all nations. That's in the tribulation. And then shall the end come, the end of the tribulation. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Whosoever uh, readeth, let him understand. Now you want to write down two pieces. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and Daniel chapter 8, 8 through 13. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, it said, uh, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. The holy place is the temple in Jerusalem on the mercy seat as they make the sacrifice there. When does that take place? Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And let's pick up verse 26. Daniel 9, 26. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off. Christ, he will die. But not for himself. He won't die for his own sins, but for yours and mine. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. There's the Antichrist. The prince there is the Antichrist. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. That flood comes out of the dragon's mouth. And unto the end, the war with desolation is determined. And he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's the seven-year period of time in the tribulation. And in the midst of the week, right smack dab in the middle of it, he shall cause the sacrifice of oblation to cease. Then so right in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist breaks his covenant with the Jews that he had with the Jews for the first three and a half period, years of the period of the tribulation and breaks that covenant and goes from Rome to Jerusalem and then goes into the temple and sits down and says, I'm God, worship me. And that occurs in the middle of the tribulation. Now back to Daniel chapter, uh, I mean not Daniel, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now you know what a lot of Christians make a, a mistake of? They make a mistake of the Antichrist in the first half of the tribulation of not being very powerful or very concerning or very much to him. Now in the first half of the tribulation, you know what the Antichrist is going to do? He is going to make war and kill one fourth of the people on this earth in the first half of the tribulation. One fourth. Now I wonder how many is one fourth of the people that are on this earth. That'd be a billions of people. That'd be a millions, billions of them. People dying. And that's in the first half of the tribulation. Not the second half. The first half. Now, you say, how do you say that, Brother Bemis? Well, uh, let me give you that from the scriptures. Turn to uh, Revelation chapter uh, 6, and let me show you that. Revelation chapter 6. All uh, right, you've read some of the passage. When does the Antichrist make a covenant with the Jews? When does the Antichrist make a covenant with the Jews? In the middle of the tribulation or at the beginning of the tribulation? At the beginning. Well, you all know that. Amen? He makes the covenant with the Jews. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. At the beginning of the tribulation. So the Antichrist makes the covenant there. So Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse. And him that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given into him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. And he would open the second seal. Uh, so that white horse rider in Revelation 6, 1, is the Antichrist. And that begins in the first part of the tribulation. Not the middle of the tribulation. It begins in the first part. But nobody knows who he is. You know why nobody knows who the uh, Antichrist is in the first half of the tribulation? Because he's a pope. 
sitting on the uh, uh, throne of the Pope ship, and he's over that throne, and they think that he is just another Pope. They think, well, just another pope, just another pope, just another pope. Well, he's just another pope. Why, he's just another pope. Those popes have been acting like that down through the ages, so nobody knows that he's an antichrist until the middle of the tribulation. Nobody knows that until he breaks that covenant. All right. Now let me show you uh, some more verses. Turn back to First Thess uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two now. And let's read it again. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and let's read it again. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now we know... What withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? Now, what does it say that he might be revealed in his time? Now, who, who's going to be revealed that he might be revealed? Who is that? That's the Antichrist. That he might be revealed. The revealed is the son of perdition. The man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. Then when is the Antichrist revealed? When do the Jews know that he's the Antichrist? In the middle of the tribulation. In the middle of the tribulation. All right, now let's read on. Now we know that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now notice in verse 6 it says, We know that what withholdeth, withholdeth, then there's something that is withholding what? Withholding the identity of the Antichrist. Now something is covering up the identity of the Antichrist so nobody can know who the Antichrist is. And he will cover up the identity of the Antichrist and the identity of the Antichrist will not be revealed until the middle of the tribulation. Now that's where this passage here is where some folks get a mid-tribulation rapture. Some folks get a mid-tribulation rapture here at this passage. They believe in it. But that's not a mid-tribulation rapture. And I'll show you that in a minute, how they confuse that. All right. Withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doeth already work then the mystery of iniquity is covering up the identity of the Antichrist. The mystery of iniquity is withholding. Now we know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. In his time is the Antichrist being revealed in his time. All right, then the mystery of iniquity is covering up the identity of the Antichrist. Now let's read on a minute. All right. Now I want you to skip verse 7 and read verse 8, and we'll go back to verse 7. Verse 8, read the middle of verse 8. And then, underline the words then, then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And then shall the wicked be revealed. Who, who's going to be revealed? The Antichrist is going to be revealed. The wicked is the Antichrist. Then, when's the word then? That's showing you a time element. Then, time is when something's going to be revealed. Then, something's going to be revealed. When? Now let's get it. Let's go back and pick up verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity... Doeth already work. It was working in Paul's day. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Then the mystery of iniquity is a person. The mystery of iniquity is covering up the identity of the Antichrist. And when the mystery of iniquity is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be revealed. 
Now, you know what most commentaries tell you that is, a, and I'm going to read you like most commentaries do. Now, most of the commentaries that I have on my shelf up here, so and so and so and so and so and so, and so come along and they tell you this. They tell you, verse 7, the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he, Holy Spirit, who now let us will let, that means to hinder, until he, Holy Spirit, be taken out of the way. And they tell you that the Holy Spirit is taken off the earth at the rapture. And they say, this is the Holy Spirit here in verse 7, and the Holy Spirit goes to heaven and leaves this earth. Well, you know what's wrong with that? It's a lie. That's what's wrong with it. You say, prove it. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, and I will show you that the Holy Spirit is in the Great Tribulation. The Holy Spirit is in the Great Tribulation. All right. Uh, Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit, my spirit, upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. I also upon the servant and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. That's the Holy Spirit coming on flesh. And I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth and blood and fire and pillar and smoke. Verse 31, showing you the context now. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now notice it says, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's not his first coming. That is not the day of Pentecost. Did the sun turn into darkness and the moon into blood? It's the day of Pentecost? No way. So that is not the first coming of Christ. That's the second coming of Christ. In the tribulation, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will be turned into blood. And there, right smack dab in the middle of the tribulation, is the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit does not leave the earth. The Holy Spirit is still here in the tribulation. The problem is the Holy Spirit no longer comes into your body and circumcises you and gives you a spiritual circumcision. The circumcision does not occur. In the tribulation, there's no new birth being born again in the tribulation. It's an Old Testament situation like it was back before the cross of Calvary. All right. Again, turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All right. And verse 7 again. For the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Then the mystery of iniquity is taken out of the way right smack dab in the middle of the tribulation. So when you go to Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18 and find out that the mystery of iniquity is destroyed right smack dab in the middle of the tribulation. And so the city of Rome is destroyed in the middle of the tribulation and then that's when the Antichrist is revealed. He goes from Rome to Jerusalem and then he's revealed. Folks know who he is. Because the mystery of iniquity was taken out of the way. Taken out of the way. I right, again... Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 13. In the tribulation, here's the thing that you want to know, and I'm, I suppose most of you know about it. Uh, Revelation chapter 13. And Revelation chapter 13, let's pick up verse 16 now. Revelation 13, 16. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, 
free and bound, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, one, or the name, two, of the beast, or the number of his name, three, either the mark in the hand or in the forehead, or the name in the hand or in the forehead, or the number in the hand or the forehead. One of those three. One of those three. Now, it says, a number of his name. Uh, here is wit, here is wisdom. Let him that hath the understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is. Now I want to tell you that the Antichrist is not a system but a man. Now where a lot of folks go wrong is trying to preach to you and tell you that the Antichrist is going to be a system. The Antichrist is not a system. The uh, communism is not the Antichrist. Communism is not the Antichrist. Catholicism is not the Antichrist. Mormonism is not the Antichrist. If he pictures to some extent, but they are not the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is what? What verse did I just read you? Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, underline it said, A man. Then the Antichrist is going to be an individual man. But he ain't going to be no system. He's going to be a man himself. All right. His number. Now he has a mark. Back in verse uh, 17. There's the mark. Now underline the word. Or the name. Or the number. Let's do it. Let's find out what the number is. Let's find out what the number is. All right. His number is. Six hundred three score and six. Then the Antichrist number is six, six, six. That's his number. Now what is his name? His name, we just went over the passage back to First Thessalonians. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we just read it. He has two names depending upon which uh, seat he's reigning in. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he is either the man of sin or the son of perdition. He's either the man of sin or the son of perdition. That's his name. That's either in the forehead or in the hand. Now there's one thing left. And brother, that is the mark. Now look at 17. Revelation 13, 17. Now, read the verse again. Did it say a mark or a name or a number? Did it say that or did I misread it? Did I misread it? It said or, didn't it? It said or. Then there's three different things. Now, you know what most folks teach? They, most folks, they teach the number, 666, 666, 666. So when you read, you pick up a commentary, 666, 666, 666. But brethren, that is only one of the three. All right? You know what the name is. The name is the son of perdition or the man who sinned. And he will be directly connected with Judas Iscariot. All right? Now let's get something on the first thing there in verse 16. And it called all, both small and great, rich or poor, free or bound, to receive a mark. Now remember, they can't buy or sell unless they receive that mark. Now what is the mark of an Antichrist? The Antichrist. Take your Bibles and turn back to Revelation chapter 13 now. Revelation chapter 13 now. And let's pick up verse 1. Revelation 13, 1. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. All right. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. 
And I stood upon the sands of the siege and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. We'll talk about those later. And upon his horns ten crowns. We'll talk about the ten crowns later. And upon his head the name of blasphemy. Now this is Revelation 13, 1. So this beast is the Antichrist now. He's the Antichrist. Uh, verse 2. And the beast which I saw was, now watch it, like unto a leopard, comma, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, comma, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion, comma, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now who is the dragon that gives him his power? The devil. Then the Antichrist gets his power directly from the devil. All right, now let's go, let's get another part there. The mouth is of a lion. Then that mouth represents the way you speak. When you said the mouth of a lion, that represents one thing, language. Language, talk, speaking, language, talk, speaking, mouth. You, the mouth is, is for a, a purpose. Talking, brother. Talking. Amen? Amen? So the way the Antichrist talks is likening to the lion. Then if you take the corresponding and you go back to the passage in the book of Daniel, you find out that the lion represents English speaking. Then the Antichrist, when he speaks, will have a universal language of the English speaking people. Now again, go back there and notice that it is the bear. It has the feet of a bear. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. Now you compare the bear in prophecy and it represents Russia. Now you know the bear represents Russia. It even The bear even has the, in the Russian symbol. Russia has a symbol of a bear. And in prophecy the bear represents Russia in prophecy. All through the book of Daniel. You, almost any book you pick up will agree that the bear represents Russia then communism will have something to do with the feet. Now, what do the feet do? What do the feet do? They get you from here to there. The feet carry you. The feet get you here, the feet carry you there, and the feet take you where it goes. Then the transportation will have to do with Russia, will have to do with the bear. How many follow what I'm saying? Follow that? Now, let's get the one in the middle. All right. Now, notice this one. Uh, and the beast that I saw was likened to a leopard. Now I give you his feet, and I give you his mouth. Now those are the other two animals, the other two represent. Then the leopard is the complete body of that, that, there, that antichrist. Then his head is different, his feet are different, and his mouth is different. But the whole basic body is likened unto a leopard. Now, what's the leopard like? Take your Bibles and let's find a couple of passages on what the leopard's like. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 13. Now, remember when God said that that leopard was a picture of the Antichrist, there's one basic thing that he's trying to represent, and that is the markings of the leopard, how he's marked. He's marked in a particular way. When you saw the leopard, you looked at his markings, and how, how he's marked is what you're looking for, because that was what it would represent. All right, Jeremiah chapter uh, 13, and Jeremiah chapter 13, let's pick up, the leopard. Verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can the Ethiopian change his skin? No, he can't. No, the leopard, his what? Spots. 
That thing is spotted. You know why it's spotted? Because the spot is connected with a mark. One is a mark and one's a spot and a spot and a mark. Now, I don't know if you follow that or not. But when you mark something, you put a mark on it. And when you spot something, you spot that thing. And you mark it and reveal it. Throughout the tribulation, God takes and puts a mark on everybody. Everybody gets a mark. All the 144,000 are marked in the forehead. That's the same, 144,000. All the Gentiles out of every nation is marked. Everybody in the tribulation's got a mark on the forehead. Saved and unsaved, the whole bunch of them got a mark. Um, not the whole bunch of them. But what kind of mark will determine on what side you're on? Whether there's going to be no guessing at it in the tribulation. <laughs> You're going to say, what side's he on? <laughs> man, you won't have to be sticking out like on the forehead. Yeah, man, man, they're going to know it, man. You're going to be marked. You say, oh, Brother Bemis, is that the other bunch marked too? Sure. How many of you know the other bunch marked? Well, yeah, amen, brother. That other bunch is marked completely on them. All right, the rest of Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23 now. Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to... To do evil. Then so here's a mark. Here's a spot. That is on a leopard. And that mark and that spot that is on that leopard is marked in a particular way. Now if you look very close at it. And get very close details and watch that leopard. And you see how he's marked. And if you look very carefully. You can look at it. That mark is just like this. Over that one loop like that. And over like that, down under here like that, down under there like that. And if you took that black thing like that, it'd be just about, uh, I don't, not, not too big, but it'd be like that, and it'd be shaped similar to that right there. And if you say, well, Brother Venus, I'll show you, I'll show you, I'll show you how to do it. You all know what it looks like? You take and you go and put you some black lipstick on. And you take that black lipstick and you go... And then you look at that mark right there on that piece of paper. And then you go through the Bible and you study a kiss. And then when you study that kiss, you'll find out that Judas Iscariot, who will be directly connected with the Antichrist, kiss Jesus Christ. You go and you'll find out that uh, throughout the Bible that a kiss is connected with an evil and very highly typified that mark right smack dab in the forehead, right across there like that. And you say, Brother Bemis, that's pretty wild. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you something even wilder. It has to do with leprosy. About six weeks to six months after they get that mark right smack dab in the forehead after they've taken it, they will come down with leprosy right in the middle of the tribulation. And every man that's taken that mark, you see, will break out in leprosy right in the forehead. Right in the forehead. And they'll break out with that leprosy. You say, why does that have to do with it? That has to do with there is only... One thing that is a sin that you can't be forgiven of. And that has to do with an unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what I believe? I believe in the middle of the tribulation, when a man takes a mark of the beast, he's going to raise his right hand, and he's going to curse the Lord Jesus Christ. And curse him. And so doing, he's going to take the mark of the beast and take a curse upon himself. All right, let me show you another passage. Take your Bibles and run. To, uh, turn to Revelation for a minute. Turn to Revelation and turn to the Revelation chapter. Uh, 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 let me find the verse. Revelation chapter fourteen. 
Revelation chapter 14, and look at verse 16 now. Revelation 14, 16. Now, have you ever thought this to yourself, who are those folks that are going to be saved in the tribulation? Look at here. All the Christians that are on this earth, as soon as the rapture occurred, they're all raptured off the earth. No saved people are here. There's no children going to be here. All the saved people are gone. Only thing that's left is unsaved people. How are they going to get saved if there's no unsaved, no saved people to tell them anything about? Number one, found here, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. This is one of the ways they'll be saved. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Then here's an angel that's flying throughout the earth. And that angel is preaching what gospel? The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. And he's preaching that as he flies around on some folk gets saved. Now what is that gospel? What did that angel say? Read the next verse. The next verse shows you what the angel said. Saying, then he said this, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him. Fear God and give glory to Him. Now in the tribulation, you know what it takes a man to be saved in the tribulation? It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to save him. Now let me show you that a minute. Take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And in Revelation chapter 12, look at verse 11. And they overcame him by what? The blood of the Lamb. Then in the tribulation, a man must have the blood of Jesus Christ to be saved. That angel comes through there and says, Fear God and give glory to Him. And then, brother, you have to get some blood. And you know how you get it? By faith. Just like you get it today. By faith. Put your trust in the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that's how you'll be saved. By putting your faith. No, I say you. <laughs> Those folks that go into the tribulation. By putting their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And again, you could write down Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. There's the blood again mentioned, that they overcome Him by the blood of the Lamb. And their, their, their robes were washed white in the blood of the Lamb. And also in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. So it is faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Plus, it's not taken the mark of the beast. Let me give you two verses, and then I'll quit here. Uh, Revelation chapter uh, Revelation chapter uh, twelve. Now, and let's look at verse seventeen. Revelation twelve seventeen. Revelation chapter twelve, verse seventeen. And the dragon was wrath with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God, Old Testament. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. New Testament. Then right there is an Old Testament element and a New Testament element. Right there is an element of faith. And woo, worse than when he said he didn't do it to the end. He cannot take the mark of the beast. So when you want to teach heresy and you want to teach damnation, you go to the book of Revelation and say you've got to keep the commandments. You take a man to hell with it. Take a man to hell with it. All right. Yeah, let me give you one more. Uh, Revelation 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12. And read the verse again. And see again that it's faith and works. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. 
So the seven day Adventist comes in there and says, you've got to keep the commandments. And where did you get it from? Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 14. See that? See how, the, see how they can take you to hell? Somebody comes along and says, you've got to live it. What do they take it? They take a tribulation truth and try to put it on a church age saint. They'll damn you with that. Now it's true in the tribulation, but it's sure not true now. The Pauline epistles prove that you're saved by faith through Christ plus nothing. But if you go to the tribulation, you'll get messed up and not only damn yourself, you'll damn somebody else. Now you say, prove that. I'll have, I've had more than one seven-day Adventist take me to those verses to prove to me salvation by keeping the Sabbath. So what it is, it's the tribulation man, not a Christian in this day and age. All right, we'll quit there and let's have a, just a few questions. We'll have about three minutes of questions and then that's all we'll have. We'll go. Anybody have a question? You may have a question. In the millennium, it'll be all works, no faith, because then they will look, be looking right at Jesus Christ and have no faith whatsoever. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 well, goes on to say that if a man preaches faith, he will be killed for it. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 10, it says in verse 10, it says, uh, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. In the, uh, After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now watch it. And they shall not teach every man his brother, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So in the tribulation, in the millennium, there's no such thing as faith. Only now, because you don't see him. Now, do you have faith in me that I'm real? No, because you see me. See? You don't have to say, have faith in me, I'm, I'm here. I'm real, worship me. Because you can see me. Follow that? You can see Jesus Christ in the millennium, so there will be no faith whatsoever involved in it. You just peer obedience. If you don't obey, you will be cast into hell. Alive! That's why he said, The hand be cut off, the eye be plucked out, then to go into hell fire alive. They throw them in hell immediately in the millennium if they don't obey so he said, it's better to pluck off the eye and pluck out the eyes and go to hell. Literally. Right on the spot in hell. All right, question. You said they. Are you saying same people? Are you saying me? No. Because you, you're not in the tribulation. You're, and when you are in the millennium, you have a perfect body that will not sin, and you won't be able to sin or even be tempted to sin. Only those that have earthly bodies that have come through the tribulation and go into the millennium who live and die with earthly bodies in the millennium. There's two kinds of people in the millennium. Those that have an earthly body and those that have a spiritual body. Two kinds of people. You have a spiritual body. They won't. Those are the ones that, that sin, not you. Um, is, is Babylon, how is Babylon connected with the Antichrist? Is that who's king? Uh, ba Babylon... That mystery Babylon is the Roman Catholic Church. The Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and 18 is not the old restored Babylon. It's impossible. It cannot be because God put a curse on the old restored Babylon and it cannot. I'll prove that to you. Revelation chapter 18. We won't go on a long drawn out thing. But in Revelation chapter 18 where most commentaries, some commentaries, will say that Revelation 18 is different than Revelation 17, and that is a lie. They are not different. They are the same. To prove that to you, look at the word her in Revelation 18.3. Her. That her goes back up to Revelation 17.18. The woman that thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth, and that city is the Vatican. Her in verse 3, her in verse 3, 
her in verse 4, her in verse 5, her in verse 6, her in verse 6, her in verse 6, her in verse 6, she in verse 6, her in verse 6, she in verse 7, her in verse 7, she in verse 7, her in verse 7, her in verse 8, she in verse 8, her in verse 8, her in verse 9, her in verse 9, her in verse 9, her in verse 9, city in verse 10, city in verse 10. They do not change. Both chapters are in the Roman Catholic Church, Babylon. And it's not mystery Babylon back then, restored Babylon, but Babylon the city, mystery Babylon the great, and the Vatican in Rome. Is when the Babylon and Daniel be a type? Of a type, a type, yes, a type. But only a type. Only a type. Not the actual thing. Because the actual thing is the city in Rome, the Vatican. The Roman Catholic Church. Which the Antichrist will reign over in the first half of the tribulation. Now in the second half, he will, the city will be destroyed by those ten kings and they will burn her with fire to the ground in the middle of the tribulation. And you won't touch Rome until that time comes. She'll rule and reign over this earth until that time comes, you won't make that much effect one way or the other. Uh, Ezekiel chapter... I was waiting for that question. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 38 and Ezekiel chapter 39 says that they are in peace. Jerusalem is in peace. Jerusalem is in peace. That can't be today. Jerusalem's not in peace, and Jerusalem will not be in peace until two times. I believe it's one of two times. There'll be no peace to Jerusalem until the Antichrist makes a covenant with them. So it may be at the first half of the tribulation that battle takes place. Or the other time the peace occurs is in the millennium. So it may occur sometime in the millennium. I don't know the exact time of the battle. Some say it happens before the rapture. Boy, I don't buy that. I don't buy it before the rapture. It may be, but boy, I don't see it. If it's there, I don't see it. I believe that, that it's Russia, though. I do believe it's Russia coming into Jerusalem and gets destroyed in that battle. I don't believe it takes place before the rapture because then you would have to look for that battle to take place before the rapture takes place. And brother, nothing's going to take place before the rapture. The rapture could occur tonight. See? It's ready to go right now. Bam! We'll go on. Amen? Amen. Okay, one more question and we'll quit. Uh, the Antichrist will be Judas Iscariot resurrected from the dead. I don't believe that the Antichrist will be the body of Judas. I believe the Antichrist will be the spirit of Judas. The body of a pope and the soul of the devil himself. He's a trinity. Body, soul, and spirit. The body be a body of a pope. You wouldn't tell it from any other pope. The, the spirit will be the spirit of, the, of Judas Iscariot. And then the soul will be the devil, like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, a carnate. He was fully God and fully man. The Antichrist will be fully devil and fully man. He'll be, he'll be the devil himself. He'll be the devil on two legs. That's what he'll be. Be the devil on two legs. Uh, some say he. Some say that the Antichrist dies in the middle of the tribulation, is a resurrected like Christ. I agree with that. I can only give about two or three verses of Scripture to show the Antichrist dies in the middle of the tribulation and is resurrected. But I'm I'm not real clear on it. But I think it does happen. Okay, that's it. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Now, folks, these are some things that you want to know and think about because as you deal with...